Okay, can we hear me? Good. So good afternoon, I'm Alex Vlacos from Valve. This is Advanced VR Rendering Performance. Um, I'm glad a lot of you are appreciating the humor in the title slide. I asked one of our artists, Tristan Reedford, he's the artist who made the Atlas robot in the robot repair demo. Um, I asked him if he could do something to take the focus off the fluorescent pastel colors. Not sure he succeeded at that part of it, but <laughs> added some good entertainment anyway. So this is effectively part two of the presentation I gave last year. Last year I gave a talk at GDC called Advanced VR Rendering. Um, this is sort of a continuation of my, my thinking about where I think VR rendering should be moving. Um, the slides and the video from last year's talk is free online. If you haven't seen it, it's worth watching. It's a good, it's a good um, primer for some of the things I'm going to be talking about, but it's not a prerequisite, so I'll cover the necessary pieces as I go from last year. So here's what I'm gonna talk about today. There's four sections today. I'm gonna to talk first about multi-GPU for VR, um, specifically how we use two and four GPUs for, uh, for VR specifically. Then I'm gonna talk about two, um, two methods for reducing fill rate at the periphery. Uh, they're called fixed foveated rendering and radial density masking. Then I'll talk a bit about reprojection. Um, I know us at Valve, we haven't spoken, we haven't said much about reprojection over the last year or two, and there's really no good reason for it, so I figured I'd cover what our thinking is on that and where, um, where we think reprojection fits into the pipeline. And the last uh, section is going to be what I'm really here to talk about today, which is the adaptive quality system, and how to basically scale your renderer up and down uh, to maintain frame rate and also give a better quality result. So one thing I want to mention before I get into the multi-GPU section, um, this is a slide from my talk last year. So if you're doing a standard uh, stereo render, you'll get, um, this is coming straight out of your, your projection matrix. Uh, as it turns out, though, most of these pixels, about 15 to 20% of these pixels, you can't see, you'll never see on the panels through the, through the optics. And so we black out these pixels as we render. So as you see, as you see all the screenshots in this talk, they're going to have these pixels blacked out. So you didn't see my talk last year, that's why. We basically have this thing called a hidden area mesh, and it's a low polygon triangle mesh that we render into the stencil buffer or into, into near depth, and that'll prevent the rasterizer from actually spending time rasterizing all those pixels that you're never going to see anyway. Okay, before we talk about multi-GPU, let's talk about single GPU. Um, single GPU, obviously you got one GPU, it's gonna do all the work, it's gonna do all the rendering, that goes without saying. Um, stereo rendering can be done on a single GPU in a number of ways. I'm gonna just show my example of sequential rendering, where we render the left eye followed by the right eye. Um, so, uh, so in a standard single GPU setup, this is a pretty traditional renderer. You're gonna render your shadow buffer up front, and then your left and right eye are gonna share those results because your shadow is RVU independent. So you render your shadow buffers, then you go ahead and render your left eye, then you submit your left eye to the VR system, and then you render your right eye, you submit your right eye texture to the VR system. And, um, and mind you, the blue, uh, the blue work, uh, the blue jobs on this, um, on, the, on the timeline are done by your application, where the gray jobs are done by the VR system. Sometimes we use the term compositor for that. And, so you render shadows, left eye, submit left, right eye, submit right. Then the application renders what we call the app window or the companion window. And the idea there is that, um, generally speaking, on the main monitor, there's a window that we're also gonna, that you're gonna render something to. It's oftentimes just a mirror of what's in one of your eyes on the HMD. But for, um, for sort of co-op experiences or for party games, there are, are developers that are rendering something completely different that's gonna go on the main desktop for the people that aren't wearing the HMD to look at. So that's a variable amount of work depending on your uh, use case. And then when the application is done, the VR system steps in, does all the lens distortion, does chaperone bounds, renders overlays, a bunch of other things. So that's, that's a standard sort of single frame. One thing I want to mention is that when you submit the left eye and right eye rendered textures to the VR system, um, there may or may not be GPU work that happens that happens there. So it's a good mental model just to assume a little bit of GPU work's gonna happen when you submit your left and right eye textures. Um, it's a good way to at least plan for something to happen if the VR system needs to do something. All right, so there are two multi-GPU affinity APIs. AMD and NVIDIA each have their own API, and they're very similar. They, all, they both try and uh, accomplish the same set of goals. Basically, there's an affinity mask and there's a bit in that mask for each GPU that's live in the system, and you set your mask and you make draw calls. And those draw calls are gonna be broadcast to all the GPUs that have their bits set. So you have two GPUs, you set your bit mask to one, and you draw, it's gonna go just to the first GPU, you set it to two, and draw to go to the second GPU, obviously you set it to three, and you, your draw call gets broadcast to both, both GPUs. So, um, 
It's pretty straightforward. The way you get stereo rendering is you can set constants differently per GPU. So you can set con different constant buffers, uh, whether it be the contents of the constant buffer or constant buffer handles. It depends on which, um, which system you're using. But effectively, you can set that up. And then there's API calls to transfer subrects of render targets across GPUs. So in a dual system, in a dual GPU setup, you're going to render to both GPUs, and then you're going to transfer one of the GPU's results back to the primary GPU. And there's also APIs to do uh, to have transfer fences, so you can asynchronously do that transfer while the destination GPU is rendering something else. So let's look at what two GPUs looks like for VR. This is pretty obvious. You've got two eyes, two panels, and first-gen HMDs. So each GPU is going to render a different eye. Okay, GPU zero renders the left eye. GPU one renders the right eye. The first thing you're going to notice when you look at the timeline below now is that um, is that the shadows are going to be redundantly rendered on both GPUs. You can't really share the shadow results across GPUs because they're being rendered independently. Now, you could think about playing games here and, and try and split the shadow rendering cost between two GPUs and then have them transfer their results back and forth. Um, but you're going to end up adding complexity to your pipeline, and it may not be a perf win because uh, transfers do cost. It takes time to transfer. So for, the, for this talk, just assume we're going to do the shadow rendering up front. Um, and so what's going to happen is you render your shadows. Both GPUs go off render shadows redundantly. Then the left eye and right eye are going to render in parallel. And this is where your big savings is with a, a, with a two GPU system. Now, after GPU one, after the right eye is done rendering, you're going to want to transfer that render target back to the primary GPU to, to GPU zero. And if you're doing MSA rendering, you want to do your resolve before that transfer, because the transfer for a standard resolution uh, render target, the recommended resolution, will take about a millisecond, give or take. So if you transfer an 8x MSAA render target, it's going to take you eight times as long. So you want to make sure you do resolve before the transfer. Now, what you'll notice is that uh, because we can use asynchronous fences, we can use transfer fences, um, as that transfer is happening back to GPU zero, we can, we can sneak as much work as we can fit in that bubble of that, that uh, transfer. So that's where we'll submit the left eye render, because it's already done, and do any of our application window rendering, that companion window. So we can hide that work in the bubble of this uh, transfer. Uh, so, we, so we're not spinning idle on GPU zero. There is going to be a bubble. If your app window is done rendering, the GPU zero has to wait for the transfer to come through. Then you submit your right eye. VR system takes over, does its rendering. Overall, with the same workload, you're only getting about a 30 35% perf boost. And that's because uh, the entire frame is not double. You're not getting double the performance, right? Shadow rendering happens redundantly. The work at the end of the frame still has to happen with submission and your app window. And the VR system has to step and do its work. So, and there's going to be a little bubble from that transfer. So it's not a doubling of performance. Um, but you do get about a 30 35% perf increase for the same GPU workload. Let's look at four GPUs. Now, there's a few ways you can split your view uh, for four GPUs. This is sort of, I think, to me, the most obvious way to do it. You split each eye in half vertically. So you have each GPU is rendering half of an eye. The reason we're going to split vertically, by the way, not horizontally, but it's not obvious, is if you think about an outdoor rendering, uh, if you're standing outside looking at the horizon, the top half of your screen is going to be the sky. The bottom half is going to be all the expensive stuff. So we generally tend to split vertically so you can get a more even, uh, even workload. So Again, you're going to have all four GPUs redundantly rendering those shadows up front. There's no savings there. It's going to cost you the same. And again, you can try and play games with transferring results back and forth. Good luck with that. I don't want to do it. Um, unless your shadow rendering is really expensive, I don't really think it's worth the effort, but you can experiment with that. Uh, then your big savings here, your four GPUs are going to be rendering half of an eye in parallel. Um, keep in mind that you're going, to do, you're going to render half the pixels per GPU now compared to to a two GPU setup. However, it's not a necessary doubling of performance per GPU because um, at least for Source 2's implementation, we are transforming the same number of verts on all four GPUs. I'm broadcasting every draw call to all four GPUs. And yes, we can be smarter about trying to cull um, for objects that are fully within the left half or right half of each eye and set your affinity mask per draw call. Our architecture turns out to be very tricky and nearly impossible to do that. So instead, uh, we just broadcast to everyone. So the transform cost is the same, but we do, get a, we do have half the fill rate per, per GPU. Um, so after you're done rendering, there's a number of ways to do these transfers uh, to get all those, the, other, the results from the other three GPUs back to the primary GPU. And the method we think, and when I say we, I mean NVIDIA and AMD, I've had a bunch of discussions with them. The way we think the right way to do it is this, is you want to first get your left eye fully, recom fully composed on the primary GPU. So transfer GPU1 back to GPU0, get your full left eye there, 
Once that's in place, then start your transfers of your two right eye textures while in, while in that transfer bubble, again, you can submit your left eye, do your app window rendering. When the right eye transfer is complete, that's when you can submit your right eye, let the VR system do its work. One thing to keep in mind is that, depending on the driver architecture, four GPUs might actually cost you quite a bit of CPU perf. Even though you're only doing one submission across four, four GPUs, the driver might be doing a bunch more work. So be conscious of that. Um, make sure you're looking at captures and be aware of what the drivers are doing. So the transfer at the bottom, there's, uh, there's other ways to transfer from four GPUs back to the primary. The bottom one is what I just talked about. The top two are just two other options. You can either, the first option up top is just start, kick off all three transfers, let them happen in parallel. Um, it depends on the hardware, it depends on the drivers, whether that's a win or not. Another way is just sequentially do it, just give each GPU um, exclusive access to that bus to transfer over into GPU zero. Which one's faster? It's hard to say. Drivers are still coming in hot. They're sort of, you know, they're still working on performance. So there's, there's a bit more, um, I, w I would say give it a few more months and keep timing these things and figure out which, how the drivers are behaving from both vendors. We think the third option at the bottom is the right way to do it. So if we kind of summarize that, if we look at, um, if we look at these three options side by side with the same GPU workload, single GPU, let's say it fills almost 11 milliseconds. Dual GPU is going to give you about a 30, 35% savings. And the disappointment here, it feels like a disappointment, is that four GPUs is only another five or 10% on top of that. Now, granted, I drew these graphs, but this is, uh, this is based on GPU view captures of what's actually happening. Um, but I think this is the wrong way to look at the data. Because if you look at the data this way, you're going to think, well, I'm not sure if four GPUs is worth even writing the code for, because it's not a huge savings. But this is not the right way to look at the data, I think. I think this is a better way to look at the data, which is instead of looking at the same workload in all of these situations, you want to look at it and say, well, for 11 milliseconds, what can I get done for a single GPU versus dual GPU versus quad GPU? And the difference here is that when you go to a dual GPU, you can likely rasterize twice the number of pixels as you can in a single GPU setup. And in a quad GPU setup, you can do three to four times the number of pixels. So you're gonna end up with a much higher quality, higher fidelity render when you have those extra GPUs. And this is what the adaptive quality system aims to accomplish that I'll talk about in a few minutes. And that's about how you can scale up your rendering quality depending on the GPU cycles that are available to you. So um, without an automated system to do this, it's a much more difficult task to try and fill the GPU and make use of all those extra cycles. Uh, but the adaptive quality system is going to try and, and accomplish that. So that's multi-GPU rendering. Um, it's pretty straightforward stuff. Just wanted to share that as give you a good mental model of how to think about multi-GPU. Um, so these are four topics. So this is, that's the first of the four topics. These first three topics I'm talking about, I'll come back to when I get to the adaptive quality system later. Now, uh, this section, I'll be honest, I really have way more than an hour of stuff to talk about, but I'm going to try and keep it to an hour. I was make, had to make a decision a couple days ago whether I cut this entire section or just speed run through it. So I'm speed running through this section. I'm going to go through it quickly. I dropped some of the details. You guys are smart. You'll figure out the details. It's not hard. But I wanted to share this, uh, this idea because um, we have this big problem with, with um, there's this difference. There's this sort of the projection matrix in our VR optics are at odds. They want their pixel density distribution to be different um, or actually opposite. And what I mean by that is the projection matrix wants a higher pixel density per degree at the periphery versus the center of your screen. If you think about how a projection matrix um, spreads its pixels out, where the VR optics want all your pixels in the center and very few pixels per degree at the periphery. So you're actually rendering the opposite pixel density that we want to show on the panels ultimately. We are over-rendering pixels at the periphery without question by a lot, potentially 2x or even more depending on, on the optics. So um, let me just recap. This is another slide from my talk last year about over-rendering. So this is your raw left and right render target that comes out of the projection matrix. And this smaller texture is how it gets warped before we put it on the panels of the HMD. And what you'll notice is the center 50% is about a one-to-one -one pixel to pixel uh, ratio what, that what we're rendering in the middle and the bigger texture uh, matches Almost this cover, sorry, covers almost the same area on the panels where the, the outer ring of pixels gets squished significantly. If you look at the door all the way on the right, if you look at the ceiling tiles, everything gets squished down. So we're over-rendering those pixels, and they actually matter less. The things you really care about are the pixels right in front of you. So um, as I was looking through this, I'm trying to think of ways to reduce the fill rate in that outer ring. And so one idea is fixed foveated rendering, and we're calling it that. It has nothing to do with eye tracking. Um, if you think about Microsoft's foveated rendering paper, if you've read it, it basically, with eye tracking, depending on where you're looking, it'll render the pixels right in front of you at very high resolution. And then as you get farther and farther away off axis, you render lower resolution um, images. 
So if we instead fix the center of that view on the center of the optics, we can uh, try and take advantage of the same idea where we can render the outer ring of pixels at a lower resolution compared to the inner circle of pixels. So if we instead render this image to four viewports and then reconstruct the image on the right, the thing we really need, you can, you can actually rasterize far fewer pixels. And what's going on here is the two circles at the bottom are full one-to-one -one resolution with, with what's on the right in the center of the screen. And the, the, the pixels on the, on the outside, on the exterior, are rendered at, say, half resolution or, or, or less. And then we scale those pixels up as we bring them in to the main render. And one thing to point out is that there's an additional occlusion mesh that I use to block out all the pixels in the center circle because you're not going to use those pixels. We're going to pull the, the pixels from the middle from the high resolution render below. Same thing for below. We're going to chop off the corners because we're not going to use those pixels anyway. The way this maps is to the final image is those center high resolution green pixels come from the bottom circles. Blue, cir blue pixels with lower resolution come from, from the lower resolution circles. And the red pixels are a blend, an interpolation between the high res and low res pixels so there's, not any, so there's no harsh discontinuity. There's some obvious ways to use multi-GPU for two and four GPUs for this. Obviously, I don't have to, I mean, you have four GPUs, you've got four, four viewports, it's pretty obvious. Um, and you can get a nice perf win if you use NVIDIA's uh, multi-resolution shading, which is also called the fast geometry shader. Um, we can easily gain another five to 10%. I don't have time to discuss, to ex explain what that is, but um, Nathan Reed from NVIDIA has done a great job uh, talking about that at SIGGRAPH last year in his GameWorks VR session. Um, and NVIDIA's got plenty of, of, uh, of information on their, their website about that. So that's fixed foveated rendering. I had an idea to do this, and you know, sometimes I'm bad, at, I'm bad at words. I'm bad at describing things to people in the office. So I tried to describe that, fixed foveated rendering, to people in the office. And, um, and I said, hey, I've got this idea. It's based on Microsoft's paper. It doesn't really use eye tracking. But anyway, I explained it. And uh, Jeep Barnett, who was one of the original uh, portal, portal team members, he worked on a neurobacular drop. I can never say that right, back at uh, DigiPen. Super smart guy, really great gameplay programmer. He's not a rendering specialist, but he's, he's really well versed. And so I explained it to him, and he said, really, it's really interesting. So I went off and I wrote, wrote the code for fixed foveated rendering, came in the next day, showed a demo. And, uh, and I was showing everyone how it worked. And Jeep goes, that's not even close to what I thought you meant. I'm like, well, what, what did you think I meant? I'm, I'm sure I explained it pretty well. And so he goes, um, he goes, well, what I thought you said was you're going to skip pixels like every other pixel as you get farther away from the center of the optics. I was laughing. I'm like, that's not how GPUs work. You can't just skip pixels. Pixels operate, you know, GPUs operate on four by four, on two by two pixel quads. And so if you touch one of a pixel in a two by two quad, you're paying the cost for the whole quad. That's how GPUs work. So, you know, anyway, later that night I'm sitting around and I'm thinking back to what he said. And I realized, I'm like, wait a minute, that's actually a really good idea. Uh, that's, yeah, let me try that. So that gave birth to this idea of radial density masking. And the idea is that instead of rendering to four viewports, inner and outer rings, you just render your normal stereo image. And that outer ring that looks darker, the reason it's darker is because we're gonna skip rendering a checkerboard pattern of, of two by two quads of pixels, okay? And if I zoom in on that, those every black um, square in that checkerboard pattern are four pixels, and they're aligned with how the GPU rasterizes, right? GPUs work on two by two quads of pixels. If you touch one of those pixels in the quad, it's the same cost as four effectively. That's how you should think about it. If you skip all four pixels, it's pretty much free. Well, it's not free, but you know, it doesn't cost you, there's no overhead there. So the idea is to, for that outer ring of pixels, we can reduce our fill rate by 50% by skipping two by two quads of pixels in a checkerboard pattern but we're gonna need a reconstruction filter to fill in those holes. So here's, um, here's the first reconstruction filter I've tried. It's a pretty straightforward one. There's obviously better ways to filter this data and fill in those holes, but I'll, I'll show this because it's, the, it's, it's a simple one that took me an hour to do. It's really easy to explain. Um, so the idea is, um, is for the pixels you didn't render, take the two nearest samples that you did render and average them. Um, that'll, that'll fill in all those holes nicely, but you're gonna end up with this really weird, jaggedy, toothy looking pattern because you're gonna be pulling black pixels down, bright pixels up. It's gonna look kind of strange. So if you then also average across the diagonals, right, for each, each pixel you did render, average it with its nearest um, diagonal neighbor, you end up with what looks like this, which is a really low resolution, blocky render, um, but you don't get any jaggy effects. And if you then take that and do the world's simplest three by three blur, for, blur filter, you'll end up with what looks like this. And this surprisingly looks nearly identical to what fixed foveated rendering looks like, where you render at half resolution and then scale up. So I'm pretty happy with the quality of this as a starting point. Again, this is the initial prototype. Um, and 
uh, but it's, you know, there's a lot of steps here. So we can optimize this in all the obvious way everyone here probably knows, which is you can optimize this by just figuring out what the, an optimal set of bilinear texture fetches are on, on the GPU. And so you can, for every pixel you didn't render, you can instead take four bilinear samples out of that, that texture with very specifically placed UVs and, and then apply these four weights to them. Same thing for the pixels you did render. You can take five bilinear samples, uh, pl set their UVs very specifically, and um, and set their weights below. And that is the same exact result as you'll get by doing the multi multi uh, stage approach on on the left. And it's at a, the cost of about four and a half samples per pixel. So that works really well. Um, radial density masking is, is really it's a good way to to reduce fill rate. And the idea is that you're going to clip these two by two pixel quads as you render. You can do this at the top of your pixel shader by calling the uh, clip function, or you can fill your stencil buffer or depth buffer up front with that, that checker pattern, but be conscious of hierarchical Z and how GPUs work. Um, it could actually cost you more to do some of these things, but implement it, time it. Of course, you have to do the reconstruction filter. Now, for aperture robot repair, for the demo we showed last year, I'm going to show a bit, a bit more of that, that today. It's about a 5 to 15% performance boost by doing just that. Um, and it's, it's, I'm pretty sure you can get higher gains depending on your content, depending on your shaders. But there's, uh, it, it, it's a pretty, it's pretty much a win overall. It's worst case scenario, I've seen it be just a wash. It didn't buy you any perf. But generally speaking, it's a good win. It's really a win on low end hardware. And what I mean by low end hardware, I'm talking about hardware that's even below what we consider the recommended spec, um, of, of GPUs. So, all right, so, let, so those are those two techniques. Uh, anyone, I don't have too much time to talk about them more, but that's just a good primer. I think something to think about, how do you reduce, um, how do you reduce fill rate at the periphery for those pixels that we are over rasterizing by, by default? So let's talk about reprojection just for a few minutes. Um, reprojection is something that is, that is uh, the, the best method we know of today for, for dealing with dropped frames, for dealing with missed frames, okay? If your engine's not hitting frame rate, the VR system, the underlying VR system, really only has one option to fill in that dropped frame, and that's through reprojection. Now, by reprojection, I, uh, uh, Oculus uses the term time warp to refer to rotation-only reprojection, I believe. I hope I don't have that wrong. And then, um, but there's also ways to do position and rotation reprojection by using a depth buffer, which I'll talk briefly about. Um, Reprojection is fine for filling in missed frames, I think, um, but you really should think about that as a last resort safety net. You absolutely should not rely on reprojection to maintain frame rate on whatever your application says is the min spec. If you tell your customers, this GPU is our min spec, you should not rely on reprojection to maintain frame rate. I think that's a bad idea because you're going to, there's artifacts, visual artifacts that come with reprojecting. So let's talk about that because I think it's important to discuss what the the, the side effects are of reprojection, so you can make good choices about when if you think it's okay for your application to use it. So the most obvious artifact is Judder. Hopefully everyone here already knows what Judder is. Uh, the idea is that anytime there's animation, you're rendering at half frame rate and you're filling in every other frame with a reprojected frame, um, you're gonna get what looks like two ghost images overlapped. And that's gonna, and we call that Judder, and that you can get that either from the camera translating, if, the, if as the user you're, you're moving around translating, squatting, standing, you're gonna get, see a ghost image of, of, uh, of what's, what's in front of you. If you're standing still and something's animating in front of you, the animation's gonna have basically two clear ghost images that are overlaid. And the farther apart those ghost images are are based on how much movement there is. Um, and of course, if you have track controllers and you're holding stuff right in front of your face and moving it around, they're gonna ghost pretty badly too. Um, but it's not that obnoxious. It's a ghost. It's not as bad as, run, as actually rendering at half frame rate and not reprojecting. So that's a known side effect. Um, that's not as big of a deal, I think, as these next issues. These side effects are the ones that sort of worry me more. It's the more subtle side effects of reprojection. And the idea is that when we talk about rotation-only reprojection, if you don't really take the time to think through what that means, uh, you might misunderstand what's really happening. And so um, when you reproject, you're actually, the reprojection is eye-centered, not head-centered. Your head, when it rotates, is head-centered. And so um, when you render an image, so these are uh, this is a top-down top -down view of two eyes and what they're looking at, and this is our left and right virtual cameras rendering their, their parallel frustums. Now when you wrote, if you're gonna reuse the output of those rendered frames as you rotate your head, what's gonna happen is your eyes are gonna change position as your head's rotating and looking left and right. In this example, it's an extreme rotation, um, but what happens is, you can see really clearly, is that we're using, those frustum that we rendered with, they're frozen in time, those images are rendered, we wanna, we wanna reuse them. 
So what's happening is you're actually fetching from images that were rendered for one eye, potentially from in front of your left eye and from behind your right eye. And this is really bizarre if you think about it from a rendering perspective that there's this sort of scaling effect that you're going to get. The more rotation that there is in your reprojection, the more of this really subtle scaling artifact you're going to get. So, um, so I, I'm worried a bit about that as far as the reprojection effects, but not as much as this next thing, which is um, your ICD. So IPD is, your, is how, how far apart your eyes physically are. Your ICD is your inter-camera distance. It's your virtual camera separation that you render with. Generally, you set your ICD to be the same as your IPD, right, as your physical eye separation. So in this example, the user has 64 millimeter separation of their eyes, so you set your virtual cameras at 64 millimeters apart. Now, in the same extreme rotation as above, if you rotate your head, which it looks like maybe about a 10, 10 or 15 degree rotation, what's going to happen is that ICD is going to artificially narrow. If you take the two vectors that are pointing straight ahead of those eyes, they're going to be artificially narrowed. And so what happens is the more you're rotating, the more you're reprojection, the more you're re reprojecting, the more your ICD, your virtual cameras are artificially narrowing and widening. And, and I'm worried about that effect on the human visual system, on your perception system, also known as your monkey brain. And, you know, I'm worried about what that does to users long term or over long, long, um, long periods of time. So we tend to think about rotation only reprojection as something that we really just want to use to fill in drop frames occasionally. Um, and when you think about how, well, how bad of an error is this, so Mike Abrash, um, in one of his Valve blog posts in 2013, I think had a really good statement, which is a leisurely head turn is in the ballpark of about 100 degrees per second, which is about this, you know, and, uh, and you can obviously rotate faster, two or 300 degrees if you're whipping your head fast. And if you reproject just one frame, that's, you'll probably go two, two or three degrees, worst case. If you're going to reproject multiple frames in a row from that same render, that's going to double. So you can easily start reprojecting five, six degrees or more. And that's where I start to get worried about these subtle side effects of reprojection. Um, so those are the side effects, but there's good things about reprojection. Uh, obviously, it's a well-understood algorithm. We've known it for decades. It's not, you know, it might actually improve. There's people looking at ways to improve rotation-only reprojection given these side effects. Um, it works reasonably well for a single missed frame. It just does, you know, there's, even with those side effects that we're aware of, for filling in drop frames, it works reasonably well. Um, and, uh, and my personal statement is that there's clearly a non-trivial set of trade-offs, but I think it's good enough to use as a last resort safety net to fill in drop frames. It's, it's better than dropping frames and rendering at 45 hertz. That goes without saying. I hope everyone in this room already, like, agrees with that. Rendering at half frame rate is not shippable, it's not showable. Uh, it's very uncomfortable to your users. So, um, so it is a usable solution. Positional reprojection is one that's a little trickier. I'll just touch on this lightly. Um, it's obviously, I think, it's still an unsolved problem to some degree. We're super interested in a solution to this because if you can do positional reprojection and you can actually take into account the, um, the new positions of the eyes and the head as you're moving and effectively have a depth value per pixel, um, that's going to produce a better result. But there's some issues, right? In a traditional render, you only get one depth value per pixel. So if you have translucency, like particle systems, good luck reprojecting that. They're going to be set at the wrong depth, okay? So you, you can't just use a traditional renderer and have it just work magically. Um, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's issues with translucency and depth there. Another subtle problem is if you're using MSAA, your depth buffer is going to be stored as multiple samples per, per pixel. But you may have already resolved the color buffer. So now if you try and reuse that resolved color buffer with those separate MSAA render, um, uh, samples, you might get color bleeding. If you have a near surface and far surface of very different colors, they're going to blend together. And when you reproject, you're going to get color bleeding across surfaces that are nowhere near each other in, uh, in uh, space. Hole filling algorithms, obviously, if you're, as you move around and you start peeking around corners or you squat or stand and you look over surfaces, there's going to be pixels that you have no data for, so you have to invent a color for those, those pixels. We call it hole filling. Um, and you have to be very careful because a lot of these algorithms can cause retinal rivalry, which means your eyes can't stereo fuse those colors because they don't match. And so it's a very tricky problem. It's a hard problem to solve, but it's something where we've been thinking about because it's, it's, it's a That'll have far fewer side effects than doing rotation-only reprojection. So then there's asynchronous reprojection. Asynchronous reprojection is the idea is that you can have um, you can have a job on the GPU that lets you say half a millisecond before vSync, no matter what's going on, the GPU gets interrupted. You preempt the GPU, and you if if the 
if the currently rendered frame is not done, it, should, it can take last frames, left, right, stereo pair, do a reprojection, rotationally reprojection, and display that, and then let the GPU continue on finishing the last frame. Um, we think this sounds like the silver bullet, the ideal safety net. If you have a system like this, then we can practically guarantee that we never drop frames on an HMD, which is super critical for consumer VR. Um, but it requires preemption granularity on the GPU that's as good or better than current generation GPUs. Um, I meant to ask AMD and NVIDIA what I can and can't say about their GPUs publicly, so I'll stick to what I believe they've already said, which is current GPUs, current generation of GPUs, we can think of it as you can generally preempt a draw call boundaries. It's not entirely true. You can go a little slightly finer, I think. But um, you're basically, you can preempt a draw call boundaries. That means if you want to step in and reproject at the end of a frame, and your VR system says step in half millisecond before VSync or one millisecond before VSync, if there's a really expensive draw call happening, like you have a two millisecond post-process call, well, what's going to happen is it won't be able to preempt in time and you're going to miss VSync. So there's really no guarantee with current GPUs, the way you can preempt, the granularity, there's no way to actually guarantee you can preempt and get there in time. You have to play a lot of games with, with uh, timing. So... Um, the applications have to be aware of preemption granularity for, for current gen GPUs for asynchronous reprojection to be a real option. And I think Nathan Reed from NVIDIA had a great thing to say at GDC last year. His statement is, if you think about post-processing, if that is an expensive draw call that could be um, blocking and not, and not allowing preemption to happen, uh, break your post-processing up into a bunch of smaller triangles and render triangle at a time with individual draw calls, right? Give the GPU and give the drivers more opportunities to be preempted. Um, and, but, uh, you know, again, there's a situations where you have track controllers, right? I can go and pick up something the size of a marble and put it right in front of my eyes, and now that's a full-screen render of, a, of this little object that you wouldn't have imagined would be full-screen, and that marble could be really expensive to render. So, you know, it's, there's, no, there's no great solution yet until GPUs can be preempted instantly. We're at a much finer granularity anyway. So um, we have this thing called an interleave reprojection hint. So uh, the reality is there are going to be GPUs and older GPUs that we care about that cannot uh, support asynchronous reprojection. So we need something else. We need an alternative. And so we have this idea. So we have this. Uh, we just added this to the OpenVR API recently. It's an interleave reprojection hint. And it's a hint in that we can request that the VR system um, opt into and every other frame rotation only reprojection if the underlying system doesn't support asynchronous reprojection. That's why it's a hint. Um, so uh, uh, the uh, Valve programmer that's been writing all of this code, his name's Aaron Leiby, he's done a really impl interesting implementation of interleaved reprojection. It's incredibly detailed and, and tricky to get right. There's a lot going on in how you predict properly, where you reproject, what your timings are. And he's got this to what I think is a really optimal implementation where um, instead of having 11 milliseconds for a frame, when you opt into this, you end up with having almost another two-thirds of a frame at your disposal, so you have about 18 milliseconds to render. So this is a great safety net. It's a good bottom of the barrel. Once you're at, you're at the bottom of your quality level, we'll talk about adaptive quality in a minute, um, you, you can opt into this and buy yourself an additional, you know, uh, seven milliseconds to render. So um, we think that's a good safety net. And it's also a safety net that the runtime could opt into, could automatically turn on when it detects your app's about to drop frame rate. We can just force this on if there's no asynchronous reprojection support on the GPU that you're rendering or in the underlying system. So it's a good trade-off, I think. Um, it's a good trade-off, and, and I agree with what Michael Antonov from Oculus said last year. He has his blog post um, from March 2015. If you haven't read it, read it. It's a really good post. It's uh, titled Asynchronous Time Warp Examined. And what he's saying here in this paragraph effectively is, I'll sort of read, I'll, I'll summarize it here, is asynchronous time warp should run at a fixed fraction of the game frame rate. Meaning, you know, if you're at 90 hertz, hertz refresh rate on the HMD, you either want to hit 90 hertz or fall down to the half rate of 45 hertz. Um, and this is going to result in image doubling, judder, but the image doubling is going to be stable because it's the same, it's the same separation frame to, frame to frame. If you target some intermediate frame rate or a variable frame rate, that judder ghost is going to jump all over the place, and it's going to be a far worse effect. So I think everyone's on the same page here that, uh, that an interleave projection, that, that approach is the right approach to fill in drop frames if you need to use that. Um, all right, well, that's what I want to say about reprojection for now. I'll come back to that in a little bit. Um, now let's talk about adaptive quality. This is what I really want to talk about. So, and I'm going to pull those other three sections in, into this. So maintaining frame rate in VR is really hard. It just is. It's way more challenging than non-VR rendering, in my opinion. And the reason for that is because um, there's two main reasons. The first is that 
the users have fine control over where that camera is. If you think about a traditional game, first-person shooter, um, you're pretty much a standing height or crouching height, and you're moving in a plane. And it's pretty easy to figure out all your perf problems. Um, and you also have this big bounding you know, bubble around you, so you can't really walk up to walls that close because we're good at our jobs. And, uh, you know, and so, but there's limitations that help us and makes it really easy to keep uh, frame rate. In VR, users can put their, that camera anywhere they want. They are fully tracked in that, that uh, space. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was laughing. We were giving a demo, and someone was looking at the robot repair demo. And I look over at the guy. He's literally laying on the floor looking up at Atlas. Like, what, what are you doing? What are you supposed to see what it looked like from down here? I was like, great, I have no idea what the perf is down there. I, I've never done that. Um, other people have come through the office that are like almost seven feet tall looking down at Atlas and like, oh, I don't know what that perf's gonna be like. I've never tried that angle, right? I'm not that tall. So, um, so, uh, there's, you usually have a lot more control over that. And additionally, we have track controllers. A lot of experiences, um, are letting users effectively reconfigure their environment. With track controllers, you can pick up objects, move things around, and if you put 100 objects scattered around a room, someone's going to take all 100 of those objects, make a pile of all those objects, and shoot a rocket at it just because it's going to be fun, right? And so it's hard to anticipate performance. It's hard to really fine-tune performance in your engines in, in VR because of the, the interaction models that we're moving to, especially with track controllers and being able to move things. So. I have personally given up on trying to tune a renderer and content to hit 90 hertz. I went through that pain last year. We got, so we showed robot repair last year at GDC. We haven't really changed the content or shaders at all since then, by the way. It's the same demo. Um, but before GDC last year, I spent a ton of time, and everyone in the room's done this, you take the worst 20% of that application of that experience and you tune your performance of your renderer, of your code, to hit frame rate for the worst case scenario. And the other 80% of your experience is in frame rate. It's not a big problem, right? Um, the problem, though, is that that was barely hitting frame rate on 980. It maintained frame rate. I didn't fail. It hit frame rate, fine. But if you dropped any lower GPU in that and run Aperture on it, it wasn't going to hit frame rate. And so thinking about how to, ma how to manage that and get to a shippable solution um, led me to think more about um, this adaptive quality system. And so that worst case 20% is what really drives our decisions usually. So I wanted to think about this differently. So adaptive quality, to state it simply, it's a way to dynamically change rendering settings. Um, to explain what that means in a second. Rendering settings to maintain frame rate while also maximizing GPU utilization. You want to be able to scale up, right? So there's two goals with this. The first goal is to scale down, to be able to reduce the chances of dropping frames and having to reproject. If you can reduce your quality a certain level, that will allow you to maintain frame rate in your worst case scenario or on lower end GPUs, it's going to be a big win because visually you don't want to reproject. You want to avoid judder. You want to avoid all these other subtle artifacts unless you absolutely need to use it. The second goal is on the other end of the scale is you want to be able to scale up and increase quality where you have GPU cycles to spend. Um, the example I'm going to use today is that robot repair demo. It's going to be running, and I have two methods for having it run in frame rate on a NVIDIA 680. It's not a typo. 680, that's a four-year-old GPU. I use that. I keep that on my second machine all the time. That's a good way to vet every decision you make. If you can get your stuff to work on a very low-end GPU that we don't even consider it a min-spec, it's below the min-spec. But if I can keep, if I can maintain frame rate with complex data sets on that GPU, we're going to be doing fine on, on the GPUs that we actually care about um, so that I've, so I'll talk a bit about that. So the benefits of this, some of them are obvious, some of them are not. Obvious benefit is you're going to have, if you have a, this adaptive quality system, it will lower your min GPU spec. You'll be able to run on lower end cards that you would have otherwise. Aperture, without changing a line of shader code or a single art asset, we're now running on four-year-old GPUs, GPUs that are four years older than what we showed last year. And that to me is pretty amazing. It's a huge benefit. Um, there's also this increased art asset limit. Basically, artists now have more control. They're less limited by the renderer. The artists now get to make the trade-off of if they want to use more complex materials, throw more geometry at a scene, at an object, um, instead of just dropping frames, you, they're just going to automatically get a slightly lower quality render. So it's up to them to kind of balance that and make that trade-off, right? Effectively, it's not my problem anymore. They get to solve that. So they can, they can manage wh what that trade-off is. Um, and, you know, obviously you won't need to rely on reprojection to maintain frame rate as long as you're within your min spec because you're, you're going to dynamically and adaptively change your render settings to keep frame rate. Those are the expected benefits. There was one unexpected benefit that I did not anticipate until I implemented it, which I think is the most important one, is the best benefit. Um, and that is that our apps look better across the board. So again, I, last year I perfed the hell out of Aperture to get that worst 20% in frame rate on a 980. 
Running on the same hardware on a 980 today, Aperture across the board looks better because the other 80% of that experience, so where there's GPU cycles to burn, we're now automatically increasing the rendering quality on the fly. And so overall, Aperture looks higher quality, higher fidelity on the same hardware that we were barely in frame rate on last year. And yes, that 20% is still barely in frame rate, but it's now auto-tuned to maintain frame rate and guarantee that you're going to hit frame rate. So what settings can you and can you not change? I'll show you a video in a minute of, that's going to show you how rapidly we're, we're going to be making quality changes. Um, but the things you can adjust are things like you can't just turn specular on and off, you know, turn it off at the low end and turn it back on on the high end because it's going to pop on and off really bad. You can't toggle shadows because as you look over here, you don't want shadows to turn off and you look over there and shadows turn back on. That's going to look terrible. Um, the things you can adjust are things that you can adjust um, discreetly or continuously that won't cause you artifacts. You can change your render resolution or your viewport size in, inside of a larger render target. We call this dynamic resolution. Halo 5 had a version of this last year. A few other games in the industry have done dynamic resolution in some form or another. Um, it's not super common, but I think it's becoming more common. Uh, we can change our MSAA level or your anti-aliasing anti algorithm. So at the high end of our scale, we want to scale up to 8x MSAA. At the low end, we want to scale down to 4x MSAA. And of course, we have these new utilities like fixed foveated rendering, radial density masking that we can turn on and off at different levels. I tend to use those, um, like radial density masking, at the low end of the scale because it's a nice sort of big hammer to, to hit low end GPUs with. Just kill a bunch of pixels at the periphery and get the fill rate savings there. Um, here's an example of an adaptive quality scale. It's a, it's a discrete scale. It's not continuous, although that's the next step, obviously, is to investigate doing a continuous scale. But a discrete scale, we have a default level zero, 4x MSAA at a resolution scale of one. And that will basically use the recommended render target scale from the API, which is 1512 by 1680 currently on, a, on the uh, Vive. And as we scale up, we'll scale up the rendering resolution all the way up to 1.4x in each dimension. And we'll also increase MSAA to 8x. And on the, on, on the way down, we'll go to a lower resolution. We're going to stay at 4x MSAA because anything less, in my opinion, anything less than 4x MSAA, uh, alias is horribly bad. So I like to bottom out of 4x MSAA. You're, to me, it's a better visual to go lower resolution with 4x MSAA than higher resolution with 2x MSAA. Um, and then at the very bottom, I turn on radial density masking because that means you're on a really low-end GPU or on a horribly fill-limited scene, uh, generally speaking. So this is a video. This is a capture of the Aperture Robot Repair demo. There should be no spoilers in here. Um, the visualization you're seeing across the top, that's a visualization we have inside the HMD for artists to look at to see what the cost of their scene is. And what happens is each box represents one of those discrete levels on that scale. And, um, and the more to the right the lot boxes light up, the higher fidelity we are. The more to the left, the lower, lower fidelity. The first green box around the middle, right around there that we just passed by, that's the default resolution. That's a 1.0 scale or 4x MSAA. Anything above that is going to be higher resolution, higher MSAA. Um, I think the second box represents what we showed at, um, at GDC last year at basically a 1.0 you know, scale or 8x MSAA. So we can scale all the way up now. And what you'll notice is that as you look at these really cheap areas at wall, and, th and by the way, this GPU, I forget which one, I think it was an NVIDIA 970, but it was sort of a... Um, near the recommended spec, or maybe slightly lower, I forget exactly which one it was, uh, sorry. But um, as we're looking at more expensive thing, uh, shots, the resolution drops down. As you look at cheaper shots, um, quality shoots up. So hope that's clear, right? Walls blank, shoots up, look at the more expensive stuff, it drops down rapidly. And so that's why you can't really toggle on and off shadows and specular, it's gonna be really obvious. So um, before we talk about how to do that, how to change quality, you have to figure out, you need to be able to measure your GPU workload accurately to know, to make a good decision about when to drop down quality levels or increase quality levels. Um, you have to keep in mind, your GPU workload is not always solid. There might be bubbles in there. And even on top of that, the VR system's GPU workload, um, might, there might be bubbles between your jobs and their jobs on the GPU. So you actually have to get the timings from the VR system. You actually don't have enough data in your application. You don't have enough visibility to the GPU to actually get an accurate timing to drive this algorithm. You have to get it from the VR system. And here's why. Here's a GPU view capture of a single frame. The orange workload in the middle is your application doing all of its rendering. 
And what you'll notice is that it, right before your application has, you know, takes over the GPU and right after, those green uh, work uh, jobs are being done by the VR system. So there's a little thing that happens at the top of the frame, mostly to synchronize with vSync and, and a few other th tricky things in there. And then at the end of the frame is where we do our lens distortion, we do chaperone, rend we render the chaperone bounds, we do overlays, anything else that's going to happen at the system level. What you actually care about, you don't care whether your app have, has bubbles, there's a little bubble at the top of the frame, there's actually a tiny bubble right before, uh, right before the last orange job before the green square at the end there. Um, anything, the thing you really care about is that end timer, or really the time remaining until the next vSync. That's really the, that's the only thing you truly care about, is you want to dynamically scale your workload to keep that time remaining within some threshold. So you have to ask the VR system because there's no way your application can get that timer. Only the VR system has the ability to get a timer at that point. It's the one that can put a, a GPU query there to, to figure that out. Um, but one thing you have to keep in mind when you're thinking about this algorithm is you have to understand timer latency and very specifically for how we predict in VR and how we're going to be rendering. So um, whenever you ask for a GPU timer, you're already one frame old. There's already one frame of latency in that timer. Um, and you might actually have one or two frames in the queue that you can't touch. Meaning, as you detect that you're already about to drop frame rate, there might be one or two frames in the queue that are already rendering that you can do nothing about. So you have to be really conscious of this as you're, as you're designing the algorithm. So let's try and look at this visually. So this, um, okay, there's a lot of data on here. So there's, there's three rows. The first two rows are on the CPU. The bottom row is on the GPU. So the top row is going to be your gameplay simulation and your render prep. The next row down is going to be where you submit your D3 calls to the API, and then below the, the black line is the work actually executing on the GPU. So if we look at the green frame, the start of the green frame on the game simulation frame is we're going to ask for the GPU for its latest timer. And what we're going to get is we're going to get the timer from the blue frame that rendered in the past. You can't get the red frame's timer yet because it's still actively rendering. One thing to note, if you didn't see my talk last year, you should watch it, it'll explain it, but this is an algorithm called running start. I think Oculus calls it um, queue ahead or something like that. And so the idea is that three milliseconds, two or three milliseconds before vSync, you want to start submitting your D3D calls to give the system enough time to actually start rendering after vSync. Anyway, watch my talk from last year, you can learn about that. But so the reason why at this point in time we're overlapping that red frame when we want to get the timer um, is because we want to start submitting early. So. If you get that timer from the blue frame at that point, the top of the green frame, and you realize we need to drop quality levels right now, uh, too bad for that red frame, it's, a it's actively rendering right now. And so if your thresholds, if you don't set your, your thresholds right or well, um, you could drop a frame uh, without having any ability to, to, to stop that. So I'll talk about how to solve that in a minute. Um, and depending on your architecture, that orange frame that's about to submit to its calls, you may or may not be able to apply a, a quality change to, to, those, to that submission thread. That's your render thread generally submitting the workload. Source 2, the way it's architected, I can't touch that frame. Everything's baked in there. Uh, it, you know, I'm just out of luck there. So, um, so on Source 2, I've got those two frames, that red and orange frame, I can do nothing about. If I decide we need to draw quality levels, it's too late for those, those two frames. But you can architect your engine to be able to step in and, and change quality on that render thread if, if you design for it. So here's the implementation details. Here's the algorithm. There's three rules. The, the goal of the rules is to maintain 70 to 90% GPU utilization, meaning of that 11 milliseconds, I want to always be between 70 and 90% of GPU usage. Um, that's, what, that's the target I want to hit. It's about seven, know, seven and a half milliseconds to 10 milliseconds, whatever that, 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 that window is. So there's three rules to maintain that. The first is the high watermark, right? Um, the 90% rule, which is 10 milliseconds. 90% of 11 milliseconds is about 10 milliseconds. And the idea is that we're going to decrease aggressively. If the last frame that rendered, that blue frame that we just queried and said, how long did that take? If that goes above that 90% that threshold, I'm going to immediately drop two quality levels aggressively. And then I'm going to wait two frames before you even look at timers again, because for our engine, there's two frames that won't, that still have the old quality settings. So it's useless data. So that's why I dropped two levels aggressively, because there's two frames I can't touch. I've got to wait two more frames to make another change. Um, on the low end, if we have three frames that, uh, consecutive frames that are below the 70% threshold, which is about 7.8 milliseconds, I will then conservatively increase by one quality level and start bringing the, the, bringing the quality back up. And again, you've got to wait two frames because you have two frames in the queue that um, are going to be using the old quality level. Now, my, my, my hope was that this would be enough to solve the problem and everything would be great. There would be no dropped frames. 
Not true. I could stand in the middle of the aperture room, I could look at the really cheap wall, whip my head around to the expensive wall, and drop a frame almost, I, I could find, I can find three or four contrived cases where I can force a frame to drop with these two rules. And I realized that because of those two frames that I can do nothing about, um, it, it's, it's too steep of a challenge to maintain frame rate when you're going, uh, when you're looking at a really simple view to a really complex view. And as you whip your head around and all that complex machinery comes into view, it's pretty easy to drop frame rate. So I needed a third rule that does some prediction. And the prediction is this. I'm going to use linear extrapolation to guess at what the next frame might cost. And linear extrapolation is just linear interpolation, but you're going to interpolate past your endpoint. And so I take the, the two most recent frames. And if the most recent frame is at least above 85%, it's getting close to being out of frame or out of our, our 70 90% window, but still a good frame. I'll use linear extrapolation to, as, to assume the same delta from the previous frame. And if that shoots past that 90% mark, I'm just going to pretend it's going to, I'm just going to assume it's going to actually be over, over budget, and I'll in, immediately drop two frames. And what that does is it gets rid of one of those frames that you can't affect, that, those red and orange frames. It basically reduces that number by, by one. And having 10% uh, um, headroom over that 90% is enough to swallow one frame. So that ended up solving basically every contrived case I could find to drop a frame in robot repair. And, you know, there's, it, it, it depends on your render. It depends on the complexity of your shaders and your environment. You might need to tweak those, those thresholds slightly, but these thresholds work really well for almost everything we've been doing. Um, and I'm pretty happy with them. So it's really simple. It's literally three if statements. The, co the code for this is not complex. Um, but the 10% idle rule is something that's important to mention. So you, the 70, 90% threshold is set that way because I want 10%. I want about one millisecond of headroom to be able to poke into as I drop quality levels. Well, this nice side effect falls out of this, which is that um, you're leaving 10% of the GPU idle for other processes. It's actually not a bad thing. This is a really good thing. And trust me, the men and women on the driver teams at NVIDIA and AMD will thank you for this because they're just, thank God, right? What happens is, you know, you can't be greedy. You're not the only game in town. There's other processes that need slices of the GPU to do what they do. Even Windows Desktop needs a couple, you know, 0 0.2, 0 0.4 milliseconds once in a while, every couple frames to do its desktop compositing. So if you try and actually utilize all 11.1 .1 milliseconds of the GPU, and even if you're within budget, you're going to drop frames because other processes are going to step in and steal GPU cycles, even if nothing's running, quote unquote. So my mental model of the GPU budget for VR has changed. Last year I stood up here and I said, you have 11.1 .1 milliseconds. I don't believe that at all anymore. You really have about 10 milliseconds and you're gonna use that extra millisecond, you're gonna share that extra millisecond with other processes and allow and give you a little headroom to poke into once in a while. Um, and so it's, it's even a scarier view of VR, how much time you really have on the GPU to maintain frame rate and not cause problems. So here's um, one of, we have a few options in Aperture. I'll show you two of them. This is the first option. Um, this is one way to maintain frame rate on an NVIDIA 680 in Aperture Robot Repair. And the idea is this. This is a, a, almost the same, I believe it's the same um, uh, settings I showed earlier on an earlier slide. And the idea is that, you know, the default level in the middle that's bold, uh, that, that if you're on the recommended hardware, like an NVIDIA 970 or the AMD, to, I forget the number, sorry, AMD, um, <laughs> whatever the AMD card is, I, I, NVIDIA does a better job naming their products, I don't know, it's just easier for me to remember their number scale. But they, um, at that level, you'll maintain frame rate in Aperture easily. Um, if you put in 680 in your machine, it's going to use that bottom bin often, but it's never going to go below it, it's never going to drop frames. It will actually maintain frame rate at 6.5 scalar in each dimension using radial density masking. Um, but the other thing you'll notice is on a 680, it will scale up and hit the default resolution often. And so even on a 680, you're getting a really good visual most of the time, except for the really, really expensive shots. And if you put a really nice card in your machine, you put like an, a, a 980 Ti or an AMD Fury X, you're going to maintain 95% of your experience is going to be at this really high fidelity, high quality level. Um, and everything looks r much crisper. And as you're at, if you put a 980 Ti in your machine and run Aperture, people look at it and take it off and go, this looks like we have higher res panels because everything, because you're now super sampling, right? You're super sampling and multi sampling. So, um, and, and that, that helps significantly in VR because of our, our ability to temporally, um, recognize aliasing. 
But what about text? So Aperture turns out to not be a great uh, example of, of designing these algorithms because there's nothing to read. There's nothing to look at. It's just an, it's, you're just looking at visuals. You're looking at objects. And when you have experiences where you have text in your environment, I'm not talking about overlays. I'm talking about text in your environment that have to be Z buffered in or depth buffered in with, with, um, with everything else you're rendering, you need enough uh, Textile density to be able to read things, and you, if you're if you have an environment where you're going to shoot at something, you need to see detail far away. You can't go as low res as 0.65. It's too low res. Even though we can maintain frame rate, it's a good proof of concept, um, and it actually works fine for aperture. It's not great for most experiences where you need to see details far away. You need to read text. So instead, my thinking is. Um, we want to keep the low end, we want to raise the low end up to about 0.8 in each dimension. We found that if you target 0.8 in each dimension of the recommended render target scale, there's enough textile density there to design text to be readable in VR, at least for the first year or two. Um, you might have text slightly larger in your environment that you might want, but it's not out of control. It's absolutely reasonable to manage. And if your GPU that you're on can't maintain frame rate at 0.8 in each dimension, and maybe with 3D density masking or fixed foveated rendering, um, oops, or fixed foveated rendering, then you can um, enable the interleaved reprojection hint that we talked about, right? And so for systems that, or GPUs that don't support asynchronous reprojection, there's this other safety net where you can tell the VR system, I'm pretty sure I'm going to drop frames in like any second now, go into this interleaved reprojection mode, uh, because I'm not doing well, I'm measuring that we're at the bottom of the barrel. So that to me is a different trade-off, and um, and you know, and it's again, it's a last resort safety net. Reprojection is something we only think of that you want to use if you're below the min spec. If you tell your customers that's my min spec, don't re try and avoid reprojection. You really shouldn't be reprojecting, except for the occasional drop frame, which will happen no matter what. Um, so here's option B on the on the right, which is now the text-friendly version of how to render uh, aperture. And everything's the same in the scale except three, three levels below default. Um, instead of going down a 0.73 scaler, I stay at 0.81, but I enable interleaved reprojection. Um, and that's another way to maintain frame rate. I don't know which one we're going to ship with yet. Like I said, 680 isn't really going to be our stated min spec. It's just sort of my, my, my harsh test case that I use. And, um, you know, we haven't made the decision on the team which one to go with, but if I look at a 680, the trade-off is, are you going to be, are you happier with the lower resolution render with slightly more aliasing or with the slightly higher resolution rendering but with Jutter? And that's sort of the trade-off you have to make for your experience is, you know, do you need the textile density or are you okay having slightly lower res rendering um, and, uh, you know, and, and maintain frame rate without reprojecting? So one thing I want to mention is why, are my, why is my scale maxing out at 1.4? Why aren't I going above 1.4? Um, memory. So, so on my adaptive quality scale, the high end uses 8x MSAA, the low end uses 4x MSAA. That means I have two sets of MSAA render targets. I have a high res 8x MSAA render target, and I have a lower res 4x MSAA render target. The 8x render target is a 1.4 scaler, so it's 2116 by 2352. It's 342 megs of GPU memory for the MSAA color buffer, MSAA depth buffer, and the resolve color buffer. And at the same time, I also have a 4x MSAA render target and its color buffer and its resolve buffer at 117 megs. So I have a total of 459 megs per eye of, re of just render targets. So this is why Source 2 is still using sequential rendering because I want to render the left eye, submit it to the, v to the VR system, and then clear those render targets and reuse them. Otherwise, I have to allocate two 918 megs of just render targets. Um, on the on the GPU, and even if you have four gigs of RAM on your GPU, using a, almost a gig of that for your render target seems a bit extreme, in my opinion. And what we really want to do is go to a 2x scaler. And if we go up to 2.0, that's one, this is really my target. This is what I want to do. Um, if you use sequential rendering, you can get away with only using only using 815 megs of render of GPU memory for your render targets. If you go double wide, you're at almost 1.7 gigs of GPU memory. So that seems extreme because it is, uh, but if you're, GP, you're on a GPU that has more than four gigs of RAM, it's actually pretty reasonable to have over a gig of render targets. It's not a big deal, I think. Don't quote me on that, it's gonna be a bad statement later. Okay, so, um, but anyway, that's our target for multi-GPU. I wanna scale up high. I wanna get really good super sampling, multi-sampling, and I wanna make use of that extra headroom um, that's left on the, on the GPU. So, this is great and all if you work at Valve and you're using Source 2, this already works for you, congratulations. For everyone else, you either have to go write the code, but as it turns out, we've been working in Unity for the last year. Um, and we have, there's a rendering plugin that I wrote, we're gonna ship on the asset store for free um, very soon in the next week or two. 
And um, so the idea is that so we're we're, we're going to ship this thing called a lab. There's about ten or fifteen experiences that we're shipping, and. Uh, Aperture robot, robot Repair is going to be in that package. So that's the only thing in the package that's been done with Source 2. Everything else we're shipping is going to be done in Unity. The reason why our team decided to start using Unity was a year ago we looked at all of the VR experiences that people were, were creating. And we found that everyone's using either Unreal or Unity. And we looked at the, you know, and this is sort of a, you know, a generic statement, but we looked at the, the, the makeup of the teams of Unreal teams versus Unity teams. And what we found is the Unreal teams were generally slightly larger, had, you know, most of them had a rendering specialist or systems programmers that would focus all their time on performance, where the Unity teams were generally smaller indie studios of one to five people um, that were really just focusing on the experience and the gameplay. And we thought one way we can make VR better is to, is to look at these engines and see if there's something we can do to make any significant impact and help external devs. So we realized if we use Unity and we can make Unity better for VR, we're going to help VR as a community be better this first year or two. And so we decided to follow the eat your own dog food rule and start using Unity in, you know, on our own team. And it was, uh, it was a really good experience. Um, and like I said, we're going to ship this rendering plugin. It's going to be free on the asset store. And I'm going to ship raw source code. I'm not going to obfuscate anything. It'll be just the raw shader code and source code. Um, the render itself is a, it's going to be a single pass forward render. Um, it's, well, it's a similar render to what is in the robot repair demo that we're using in Source 2. And it's forward renderer because, like I talked about last year, we want MSAA, 4X and 8X MSAA. And I want to support up to, I think the limit is 18 dynamic shadowing lights. And it has the adaptive quality system or a version of it. Um, and again, the reason why this renderer is, you know, to me, rendering, we're going to go back to basics. We're starting with more simplistic renderers. I'm more interested in, in getting high fidelity renders, high quality, super sampled renders than I am getting the most, you know, the latest, most insane pixel shading happening. For VR, there's so many pixels we have to shade. I personally prefer the, going the route of just super sampling a more simplistic sort of basic renderer and let your artist kind of shine there. Um, and I do want to thank these devs. So Peter Kuhn and Scott Flynn at Unity. If you don't know these guys, if you're doing VR work in Unity, you should know Peter Kuhn and Scott Flynn. They're super smart guys. They're, uh, they're two of the main devs working in the VR systems inside of Unity. Their offices are actually two blocks from Valve. So, uh, so th we've been at each other's desks over the last two months going back and forth to bugging stuff and, and adding features. And they were a, hu a huge help in adding the features we needed to get adaptive quality hooks in place so we can drive adaptive quality from C Sharp scripts inside of Unity. So this is not a, a native, built-in, transparent thing. This is something you can implement in a C-sharp script in Unity and drive yourself. Um, Joachim Anti, who's their CTO, is super helpful. Um, and by the way, a CTO of an 800-person company, this guy is familiar with almost the whole code base. It's frightening. Um, but it's, it's, isn't, there's a reason why Unity is a really solid engine. Um, and Rich Geldrich, who was at, at Valve for a while, um, was at Unity recently, was super helpful in getting this all done. So this is now, the hooks are there as of Unity 5 for Beta 9 that shipped a week ago, and I think Beta 10 just shipped a, a couple days ago. Um, so we're now finally have all the right hooks to release the rendering plugin, which I'll do when I get back, back to the office. The last thing I want to talk about for just one more minute here is the thing I think is next. The thing, I'm, the thing I want to work on next, the thing I think is, is sort of the, the next logical um, continuation of this thought process. And once you have adaptive quality and you get in your head and you finally realize that GPU performance to some degree is mostly a solved problem in that you will always maintain frame rate. And we have a good set of tools at our disposal where I don't worry about GPU perf so much anymore. What I worry about is CPU perf because we're not dropping frames because of GPU workload anymore in our applications. We're dropping frames because the CPU didn't deliver a frame to the render thread fast enough and it's got nothing to render. And that's when we have to opt into reprojection and rely on these safety nets. So what I want to do is I want to effectively make our render thread autonomous. I want to feed it a render thread. I want to feed it a workload for, for a frame. But I want the render thread, and after it submits it, to not throw all that, that data out. I want it to hold on to it. And the idea is that if the CPU isn't ready with a new frame when I need it, at running start, at, at that next vSync, if, if it's not ready to feed me another frame, too late, sorry, I'm going to go and resubmit the entire frame from last that we had last frame. I'm not going to reproject. I'm going to actually remake all those draw calls with updated transform from where the HMD actually is now. And if you think about what that does, it decouples your CPU and GPU performance. It allows you to actually re-render everything in your scene from, the, from where the HMD is now. But again, it's going to, that's going to be, if you just do just that, it's going to be a frozen frame. It's going to be the world frozen in time from last frame, and you're going to get judder. You're going to get animation judder, right? Not movement judder, because you're going to have smooth movement, but anything that's animating is going to judder. 
So the idea is to feed the render thread always, always feed the render thread an additional frame of animation at some point in the near future to allow you to roll animation forward for an additional one or two frames so that if you do need to resubmit, you can keep everything in your world moving forward just one or two frames. Um, I'm, not, I'm not minimizing this. This is a non-trivial problem for some animation systems. Just be clear about that. If you're playing back a canned animation, it is pretty trivial. Uh, just give the next, you know, <laughs> the next set of poses down. But if you're doing with track controllers and movement and physics, you have to do a little bit of work to, to try and come up with good animation prediction to give your something to render, um, to keep animation rolling forward. The thing about this, when you get through that thought process and you realize, okay, if we get that working, and we have a partial implementation in Source 2, nothing to really talk about right now, but it's a partial implementation. If you get to that stage, it's not just about a safety net for your CPU not hitting frame rate. See, 11.1 .1 milliseconds is not just a GPU problem, it's a CPU problem. So you can now make the assumption that I have two frames or th even three frames to render, to deal all, with all my simulation on the CPU. You can now plan to have 22 or 33 milliseconds to run your gameplay simulation and your physics and everything else, as long as that, that render thread can autonomously roll forward and keep things moving. So. I don't know. Anyway, to me, I, I think that's the next big step in VR performance and rendering. I think that's really what I think we're, where we're kind of moving to. So we talked about multi-GPU support. I think it should be in every VR engine. At least two GPUs should be supported, four ideally. Um, two is pretty easy. I mean, it's, you got two eyes, two GPUs. It's not that hard. It took me a day to get the first one in there, to get two, two GPUs. Um, fixed OVA to rendering, radial density masking. These are two solutions to reduce fill rate at the periphery for pixels we're over-rendering. Think about that a bit. There's other solutions here. Um, the adaptive quality, like we said, scales up and down, leaves 10% for other processes, really important. And it helps us not rely on reprojection to hit frame rate on our min spec, and that's really important. Um, the rendering plugin, like I said, will be on the Unity Asset Store free. Even if you're not a Unity dev, go on the Asset Store and download it. The adaptive quality code is going to just be there, uh, shipped raw. I mean, it's three if statements, to, to be fair. But anyway, it's, it's, uh, it's, um, it's there to look at. And again, think about how your engine can decouple CPU and GPU perf um, and use, uh, use a system like resubmission on your render thread to help maintain frame rate. Thank you.